Um, I want to echo what Dina said and thanks all of you guys for coming. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Carolyn Ramo, I'm the director of Artadia. Uh, Artadia was founded 16 years ago now in San Francisco, so it's an incredibly important city for us. Um, we offer unrestricted grants and all sorts of other kinds of support to visual artists in now seven cities across the U.S. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that we're going to be doing a San Francisco cycle soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all of the wonderful Artadia awardees that are in the room. There's quite a lot of you guys, so thanks for coming. Um, and also Dina Beard and her staff at the lab um, for hosting this tonight. So this is our first time running an art and dialogue program in San Francisco. It's our third time ever. Um, this program was conceived because we give grants in a specific way where we have curators be our jury and they do studio visits with finalists and we find that those studio visits are really a wonderful way to promote dialogue and to really have curators get to experience a city that they might not know. So we are going to be sending many curators to our seven cities. They do studio visits with awardees. Um, we'll be coming back year after year, so um, everybody will get a visit in the next few years. Um, and then on top of that, they're, they're going to be presenting their work in a public platform, which is the first time that Artadia has really been able to sort of express how we feel about dialogue and communication and how important the living artist is. Um, and so I wanted to introduce Hamza Walker who is going to be our speaker for tonight. He is, again, doing lots of visits the past couple of days, so he's been really immersed in the San Francisco culture. Um, he comes to us from Chicago, although by way of Los Angeles. He is the um, Director of Education and Associate Curator at the Renaissance Society, where he's been for 20 years, 21 years. Um, and he's the next curator of Made in LA at the Hammer with Aaron Boschietti. So that opens in June of 2016. It's a survey of artists working in Southern California and LA County. So look out for that if you guys are down there. Um, so again, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the lab. We're, we're really happy about tonight. So thanks so much. guys for having me. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Artadia. I could actually put in a request for another one of these and to say I think there might be a couple of seats. There's at least one that I just gave up. So please, somebody take, take that seat. Um, so yeah, so we get another one of these. So it's very, very funny. I feel like a, kind of a trading places moment because Jordan Stein is actually in my seat. Uh, at the Renaissance Society, and I know this was these were his his stomping grounds. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to talk about some shows. Uh, it'll take some, um, uh, hopefully, uh, in terms of the examples that I have. Uh, the talk will take on some kind of contours in terms of the types of exhibitions I'm going to talk about. Um, but the question and answer sessions are always the most fun. So we'll see if we can. Get there. So fasten your seatbelts. We've got 160 slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about. Yeah, I mean, people have things like yeah, art history in a dark room. Why not? Why not? So, uh, the um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Renaissance Society. Um, I'll talk a lot about the Renaissance Society actually, uh, but just to give a background before talking about exhibitions. Um, this is the lovely city of Chicago. Uh, in the foreground, that's the campus, the University of Chicago. Downtown in the background, Hyde Park is the neighborhood where the University of Chicago is located, which is about seven miles south of the Loop, um, Chicago's downtown area. In the foreground, that's the historic quadrangle for the University of Chicago, uh, which is built in 1890. Henry Ives Cobb was the uh, architect for uh, what is now the historic Farm Wrangle, um, the first kind of master planner for the University of Chicago. So this is 1893, which was the World's Fair. Um, the University of Chicago, and actually in the 
this is looking across the midway again at what's now um, uh, the historic quadrant. The, the University of Chicago is undergoing the biggest building boom um, in its history um, since its founding right now. So uh, the campus is uh, expanding. Um, this, in 1893, when the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair opened, um, the, the president of the University of Chicago, they said, well, you know, it was a very, uh, uh, very young institution, you know, just a few years old, and they had completed this, um, these first series of buildings, and they asked, uh, uh, I believe it was William Rainey Harper, if he wanted to have an opening, like a grand celebration um, that would coincide with the World's Fair. And he looked shocked and he said, no, of course not. I want people to think that it's always been here. <laughs> Which says a lot about the University of Chicago as a culture. <laughs> so this is an old postcard. Um, and the Renaissance Society is located in, I can use this, is right about here in this building. These are the founding fathers. <laughs> um, and you can't, it's about to turn 100. Um, this fall will be the centennial. And it wasn't, you, know, you have to imagine this is the University of Chicago, uh, 1915. Uh, even then, the University of Chicago was a bastion of conservative thought. Um, so it did not embrace modern, then contemporary art with open arms. Just to put it in context, it was also the time of the Armory Exhibition. So the founding of the society is sort of, you know, to some extent, uh, bound up in the reception of modernism in America. Right? So the, the Armory Exhibition was in New York, it was in Chicago. In Chicago, there were you know, protests uh, where they actually burned an effigy of Matisse. <laughs> um, so these 1915 uh, faculty trustees of the University of Chicago got together and wanted to, there was no museum, uh, it didn't, the university didn't have an art department, all the art history classes were offered through classics. Uh, they got together and said, okay, we need to, we, we want to have um, uh, uh, the students and the members of the Hyde Park community need to have a place where they can have a fine arts experience. So they founded the Renaissance Society um, uh, as a place, what's, what is it, uh, uh, for, um, I'll, get the, I'll have to get the wording exactly right, but the, the most progressive thing that they did is they founded it as an affiliate organization. Um, it was its, its own separate 501c3, essentially. It's got its own board of directors, and it's non-collective. And they specified that any property that the Renaissance Society would acquire would become the property of the University of Chicago. So it was always a separate entity in that regard, which turned out to be um, uh, quite important for its survival. So there's an elevation of Cobb Hall. And so the Renaissance Society is located up on the fourth floor of this building. Cobb Hall is a multi-use classroom um, facility. And it's one of the few buildings on the main campus that still uh, is used for the same purposes as when it was originally built. So it's the floor plan, the gallery, so the space. And this is just to give context for the slides I'm going to show across the room. So it had a few homes on campus. It didn't move into this space until 1979. Um, the, the top floor of Cobb Hall um, was originally, this space was carved up into a worn of uh, classrooms, offices, and a very small library. Uh, 1967, uh, the building was built in 1902. 1967, it was modernized. They put in the elevator. Um, uh, and they built a gallery. Uh, in this space, a uh, student gallery that by 19, 1967, by 1979, it had pretty much fallen into neglect. Um, and the music department 
wanted to expand and kick the Renaissance Society out of Goodspeed Hall, which is two buildings over, at which point it moved into this, this space. And that truss work was built in 1967 for a series of movable walls and the lighting system. So it's not at all um, structural with respect to the building. So these are, and it's symmetrical. So in terms of this being both the view east or west, it's got these very funky alcoves, corners. So as far as exhibitions, um, done uh, all kinds of exhibitions. Tonight I wanted to talk about group exhibitions, uh, which is not to say that I haven't done uh, monographic exhibitions. Uh, I like them all. Uh, every type, flavor, kind, variety of exhibition. Uh, as far as monographic exhibitions, you know, working with an individual artist, you can do new projects with them, surveys, retrospectives. Um, with respect to group exhibitions, uh, you can do, you know, medium-specific shows, you know, painting now, um, video art then. Uh, you can do region-specific shows. Um, so to try and do, um, uh, where's my boss, Suzanne Gez, who was at the Society, she just retired for 40 years, uh, is primarily known for wor her work with uh, individual artists. Um, I had actually, before coming to the Society, volunteered for Randolph Street Gallery, which was an artist-run um, space that was founded in 1977, which pretty much did all group exhibitions. So I was on the exhibitions committee. So uh, what I knew of curating um, through volunteering for Randolph Street Gallery was primarily um, group exhibitions seemed to just kind of, uh, uh, that's what curating kind of meant to me at that time, just by default in terms of being on the exhibitions committee and helping organize shows. Um, I graduated from college in 88. Uh, I worked as a secretary at Urban Gateways, the Center for Arts and Education and Development Office. Um, but I also volunteered for a new music organization, South End Music Works. My friend Paul is here, my oldest, dearest friends. Um, which is very, very important because I wear a couple of hats to Renaissance Society. I also do all the public programs, so the lectures, concerts, readings, screenings. Um, but that was as important to me as my stint um, volunteering for Randolph Street Gallery um, as far as a sense of belonging to a cultural community um, and just thinking of it as kind of like just undifferentiated activity. Um, but volunteering for South End taught me a lot. It's very funny. I did a studio visit today with Rebecca uh, uh, Bollinger. And she, Paul, you won't believe this, she actually asked me if I knew what a doxophone was. Hans Reichel's gig. You remember that? I'm sure you do. And I surprised her by saying, I, in fact, do know what a doxophone is. <laughs> you know, and was actually know who invented it. Um, what is it? It is a strip, uh, these, it's a, it's a, a Hans Reichel, uh homemade instrument. Um, there's actually someone here, apparently, who's studying at Berkeley who plays them as well. Strips of wood, very finely milled and crafted that you bow, but it actually works. You can move it, you know, you can clamp it to a tabletop, but you essentially move it and, you know, uh, you get different frequencies depending on how much of it is extended, you know, off of the surface that it's attached to. So he's kind of mastered, and these pieces of wood are quite beautiful and elaborate in terms of how they're milled and shaped to get these different tones out of them. Um, but that was just such a surprising thing to do, to be asked what, what, what someone asked me if I knew what a doxophone was, to be able to say yes. So. Um, so Randolph Street Gallery, group exhibitions were something of a default for me. Um, even though I'd worked on exhibitions, I started at, at the Renaissance Society in 1994. I didn't curate an exhibition until 2001. Um, at that, even though I worked for seven years in a curatorial capacity on all the exhibitions with my boss, Suzanne doesn't write, so all of the writing fell to me. 
And so I actually had unfettered access to the artists. So usually there's kind of like a chain of command between curatorial and an educational department, um, or the extent to which writing resides within curatorial, and that hierarchy didn't exist at the Renaissance Society. So you know, she would just dispatch me and say, oh, you want to write about Lou Thomas? Oh, go to a studio and go see him. So-and-so, go and just talk to him. So, um, you know, in that regard, you know, um, and also volunteering at Randolph Street Gallery, I've been curating exhibitions, you know, working on exhibitions in that function before actually doing my first shows at the Renaissance Society. But in 2001, this is one of the first shows, Spec, um, it's by Simpark, collaborative, Steve Badgett, Matt Lynch. Um, Simpark collaborated with Kevin Drum, who is a musician, does uh, experimental electronic music. They built this Quonset hut. It's a drop ceiling, which they then kind of altered so that it dropped down to this barrel vault. They installed lights, speakers, as though it were a normal drop ceiling, um, and then built this 72 foot long bench. That's what the interior looked like. And Kevin Drum did a 50 minute long composition. Uh, the subwoofers were in the bench. And this was 2001, which is a real peak moment, I would say, for electronic music. Um, back then, I was just listening to Finesse's In the Summer the other day. Um, it's a really beautiful record. New Video, New York. This is a, both a region specific and medium specific show. It's about 32 artists, 16 countries, from the Baltics down through the Balkans, a survey. The room, the gallery was divided up basically into four cineplexes. Anna Steinschlager, she's a Chicago photographer. And these are just examples of, of, of different shows, just to give a sense of the range. Um, Anna's work is very it's autobiographical. Um, she's um, an Orthodox Jew. Uh, underwent something of an existential crisis with respect to her faith, uh, at which point she began photographing uh, these done portraits of Orthodox Jewish couples, as well as quotidian moments in her life, uh, but a very beautiful body of work um, you know, that came about at a real specific point in her life. Anmi van Kerkhoven, Belgian artist. And it's hard to see. She actually painted the walls black and white, uh, black on the bottom, white on top. And Tom Venendi, a photographer, he photographed these. And it looks, it's very hard to see, but those are actually two different walls, one in front of another. But because they're, you know, black on the bottom, one half, and then black on top of the other half, it looks like one wall, sort of. It's actually two, and you can walk between them. And another view of her show. Bill O'Brien, a Chicago artist, um, does all kinds of stuff, paintings, drawings, ceramics. This is a survey, a survey. This is just a show of his ceramic works. Very, very prolific. Artadia Awardee. Oh, Artadia Awardee. That's great. I'm starting with him today. So, group exhibition. Um, I was the kind of uh, default librarian at the Renaissance Society. At one point, uh, the book just got out of control in terms of storage and space. And um, pulled them all out one summer, several years ago, close to 10 years. Um, brought them into the gallery, decided to arrange it so it was a more so it was a resource, essentially, as opposed to just like lots of books that were there. But it was nice um, as an opportunity to go through thousands of volumes of books. Um, and also ended up fueling what is basically a, a fetish that I have. Um, but it was also, it gave me pause for thought about um, doing exhibitions. Um, I started thinking about them in a different way after surveying 
you know, a number of these were catalogs for group exhibitions. Um, and it was funny thinking about where do ideas for exhibitions come from? Um, what would distinguish, you know, an exhibition that I was going to, you know, undertake from any other exhibition, in a sense? Um, and it was quite humbling, I guess is a better way to put it, in terms of going through these books. But here's a survey of some of them. Um, this one, Kunst und Heisen, Art and Heating. <laughs> Very funny. They gave a this heating company gave a series of heating units to different artists, different sculptors, and dismantled them for this exhibition. That was hysterical. Cruciformed. This is images of the cross since 1980. <laughs> Shows about birds. Shows about balloons. <laughs> Shows about plastic. Shows about boxing. Show about sand. UFOs. <laughs> Puppets. I was talking about the puppet show earlier, Benjamin today. Hair. This is not so cute and cuddly. The doll and stuffed animal in contemporary art. <laughs> Mothers. Apes. The bomb in Australian art. <laughs> uh, the bomb in Australian art, to be fair. Um, Australia was the site of major nuclear testing. And so there's a history of protest, of anti-nuclear protest in Australia, which is where this comes out of. But that's one hell of a tagline. <laughs> Outside New York. Which I think is New Jersey. <laughs> Art from Brazil in New York. <laughs> Art from London in Zurich. This one is really great. And this took a second for me to really get, like, to get, it's like eight people from Europe. <laughs> so, you know, it's like eight artists from Japan, right? And you wouldn't think twice about that show. And I just feel like it's like, yeah, actually, it's not a two-way street. When you reverse the terms, you do see what's going on. <laughs> so, but just, it's like, and that had been sitting, it's like, why is this? It's like, you know, it just took a second for me to realize, like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and this is uh, one of my favorites. Um, Flesh at War with Enigma. <laughs> this is actually a show by a friend, Adam Zimchich, who's doing the next documenta. Um, great show. I actually saw this show in Alina Zhapashnikov. It was the first time I'd seen her work was in this show. But that title just killed me. Yeah. Um, but instead of thinking about exhibitions uh, or, or as an activity, and now this is before there were, you know, now there are curator programs and all that stuff. This is before that. This is it, it, like what would distinguish this activity, it's like, no, 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 no. I decided to cast my lot with these shows. That a show is a show is a show is a show. You know? So just whatever the organizing principle was gonna be, hair, UFOs, mothers, it would just be an excuse to be able to put some art in a room, right? So to just streamline the thinking and just like, get up to get down, just one show after another. <laughs> just like, all right, like, <laughs> you know? So that was really, um, so I did a, I, I, I wanted to do a series of shows after putting together the library that was as straight ahead as possible. Um, so I did, um, it was like 06, 07, 05, 06, 07. Um, 
a show about war, a show about race, and a show about silence. Those were the three that I thought of. Like, it's like I wanted to distill that shit down, just like mothers, UFO, puppets, sand, like, wham. I don't want to have like there's no elevator. What is your show about? War. Yeah. What is your show about? Race. Like, and, and people were just like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, like, really do shows like. You know, and colleagues were like, kind of straight away, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, like, actually, those are the topics that actually do require curating. And I just yeah. actually want to see, and I worked for public art for three years, so I kind of put in my time, for almost four years, in terms of, like, seeing, you know, a, a tier of, like, cultural production, dying squaw, homage to Obatala, like, just whatever, you know, and just feeling like, okay, race, war, there's just art out there, you know? And just go through and look at it and see what's what, you know? And so, um, these would be, you know, as far as organizing principles and excuse um, to really um, parse a more fertile field and terrain that I think um, kind of more narrow, highly self-conscious kind of theoretical take on doing a show, right? I just wanted to strip the shit down. So this was Meanwhile in Baghdad. And this was three years, this is three, this is four years, 2007, 2006, 2007. This is four years after the war, you know, and um, had started, you know. And um, it was just interesting in terms of deciding to do it the, by, by at which time Iraq drifted, had drifted from being on the front page of the newspapers to just being like page three, right? And it just stopped being, you know, like being at war. It had just become like, you know, in terms of figure ground, it had gone from being a figure to becoming just the ground, like the context, right? So, you know, the idea was much more just like, okay, well, any art that you look at now, you know, is going to, you know, that's the ground. The war is just going on in the background, right? Which I just think is a different kind of perspective to take on. Some legislation we use. Marin Joffrey, series of collages. Jonathan Monk, Dead Man in the Foreground. Waleed Beshti's photographs on the left. A view. And these photographs by Waleed about three feet by six feet. They're actually of the Iraq embassy in um, Berlin uh, after it had been abandoned in 1992 with the first round of sanctions on Iraq. Um, so the Iraqi government, you know, they own the embassy, they own the land, um, but when the sanctions were declared after the first Gulf War, they basically abandoned, they basically abandoned the embassy and it just fell into disrepair. Um, so, you know, more than 10 years later, Waleed went in and photographed, um, you know, the space where just, that just made the police event. Now, it, it, it was funny, and then with the film, he actually left it in his bags and it had been run through an x-ray machine. So then it got faded by accident. Um, so a very beautiful body of work in terms of the way that it was uh, meant to be misread in relationship to the days and weeks or months of looting that took place um, you know, when we invaded Iraq in three. Jenny Holzer's redaction paintings. Jonathan Monk. This was made, uh, fabricated by Madame, Tuss uh, uh, Madame Tussauds uh, Wax Museum. And it's based on Chris Burden, actually, um, the famous performance where he had himself shot. Uh, and Jonathan Monk imagined that if the, you know, if it had been a few inches off, This is Ann Messner. This is a broadside that she produced that you could just take. Disasters of War. And it consisted of a series uh, of um, 
different intellectuals writing about uh, the war in Iraq up to that point, those first four years. Oh, in the background is Giannis Kunelis. And that's their piece. Another Waleed Beshti, a pair of Waleed Beshti photographs. This is the Giannis Kunelis piece. Which was a, that piece, the show was 2007, and this piece was 2006, I believe. So it was a new piece from Giannis Kunelis. Very beautiful, these um, uh, army, these medical cots. You know, these strips of canvas painted in this kind of brick blood red. And that bed that's on the wall is actually hung from meat hooks. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, Canellis yeah, is pretty rocking and rolling. You know, it was quite beautiful, again, you know, thinking about the war as the backdrop for this piece, right? So I don't think you need to ask what this piece was responding to. You know, it was a very, I mean, you remember the bombings, the car bombs going off, those first, you know, moments really bad. These are mine, Joffrey's collages. These are all newspaper articles. Despite the photographs, the newspaper articles are actually taken from the late 19th century up through the 19, all the way up through the first Gulf War. So the headlines, so she's taken out any references that would actually date the newspaper article. So you would read the headline, and actually you could read the article, and you would think that it was referring again to events as they were happening in Iraq at that time, you know, you know, between 03 and 07. But in fact, these articles had been written years and years and years earlier. Some of those, like the late 19th century. And so here's one that still resonates. Matt Davis, a paratrooper. Daniel Heyman, he actually, this is after Abu Ghraib. He'd been invited by a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. He's a Philadelphia boy. Um, he met a human rights lawyer who'd been invited to actually take the depositions of uh, some of the prisoners at Abu Ghraib. And they met, and she actually said, you know what? I actually want you to come along with me while I do the depositions. And of all the things he decided to do or make a series of etchings, you know. Um, as Goya lives. Beautiful. This is Adele Abedin. It's a video piece included in the show. He's from Iraq um, and living in uh, in Stockholm. Uh, he actually made this video when he returned to Iraq um, and saw a young girl playing in the rubble of a building that had been you know, bombed out. So this is Black is Black Ain't, a show about race. And somebody, uh, was it? Who, who was I talking to? He said, oh, you should show your files. For what does a file look like? You know, how do you develop an exhibition? Um, so before showing images of the show installation shots, I thought I would just include clippings. The show was 2008, and I was actually working on the show for two years before, so well before even Obama had announced um, uh, that he was going to run for, 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 for office. Um, and a lot of the shows um, that I do are actually discursive. They're sometimes responses. I'm not very creative or imaginative. Um, and they tend to be responses to other people's exhibitions. Uh, and again, categorically, you know, if I say, oh, you know, God, I would never do a show like that, you know, or something like that. It's like, if I ever catch myself saying that, that's usually the first thing I'm going to do. <laughs> to say, you know, so actually the show started off by saying, I never do a show about race. Uh, you know, and it was like, oh, well, now you got to do a show about race. Yeah. Now I have to do a war show. It's like, oh, well, you can strip down. you got to do a war show. Uh, and here, um, 
there had been a number of exhibitions, uh, you know, in, you know, in the wake of you know, Thelma Golden's freestyle. And she was a direct response to freestyle, where she said, "Okay, a whole generation of artists who no, no longer have to address the issue of race, free to be you and me." Um, uh, so operating under the rubric of pluralism, but I said, okay, wait, that doesn't, you know, Elvis has left the building, but the building is still there. So um, that was um, part of the reason for doing it. Um, yeah, just in terms of thinking of shows um, of all black artists, as those had doubled as exhibitions about race. And I think freestyle was very important for, um, as a real dividing line about that would no longer be acceptable, right? That was no longer, you know, after freestyle, it's like, you know, that was part of the upshot, I think, of what Thelma was getting at you know, in the show. It's like, oh, no, 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 you know, now that artists are free to be you and me, you know, young black artists no longer obligated to address the issue of race. You can no longer have a show of all black artists and then assume that that doubles as a show about the topic of race. So, um, and again, these are just all different shows that I was thinking about while doing it. Uh, but this is, these are my clippings from that time in the file. I don't know if any of you remember this. When it turns out that Al Sharpton is descended, the family that, that Strom Thurmond, Strom Thurmond's family, they own slaves, and Al Sharpton is actually a descendant of the slaves that Strom Thurmond's family owned. You say, damn, no irony at all. Straight up. Straight up. It's on the front lines. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. Of all people, Al Sharpton. It's like, oh my God. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, so this one, the burial for the N word. So these were all just things that were, you know, this is where in terms of the discourse of race, you know, between 06 and 08. And I just love the idea of, you know, ongoing black firsts. First black female to make it to the Arctic. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, working on the show you know, it was interesting, the point at which it was quite a while uh, before race emerged I mean, as an issue in the, in the campaign. You know. The dismantling of public housing in Chicago, very, very, I think of that as like probably the most monumental thing to, I've lived in Chicago for 30 years, as far as the, one of the biggest transformations in the city. Um, dismantling of the Robert Taylor homes and pretty much Cabrini Green. Um, but the way that it was structured in terms of the displacement of the residents, um, the idea of saying, oh, no, 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 you know, we'll build housing and you'll be, you know, you'll be able to come back. I mean, you move people and then three years later, it's like, no, they're not going to go back. You know? So it was in bad faith, I think. Um, Katrina. In the way that the money was doled out. Right, so the ongoing dismantling of affirmative action. Right, and I just like how these images play out yeah. visually in the paper. Right? A Nivea ad. Wow. Right. My skin refuses to be taken for granted by anyone. Here's a Dove ad which got pulled. I don't know if any of you remember this this moment. Dove, they they didn't know the spectrum from black to white, and they so they they didn't nobody saw it, and then they got all these complaints that like is that what the motion does? <laughs> like, <laughs> so they <laughs> Dove instantly. You know. You know, and it's like, it's really funny because I'm like, I wouldn't have caught that. <laughs> I think this was my coffee cozy. This 
This was an ad for a TV station, a cable channel, but it was taken from the Damon Wayans joke, you know, based on the sixth sense. So this is the floor plan for Black is Black Ink. Just run through real quick. This is the entrance. This was the poster announcement for the show by Carl Pope. So this went out to about 10,000 people. Yeah. It was funny, it was in the coffee shop. And this, it was in the coffee shop and actually it was up on the wall for like a year after the show or something. And then there was a complaint from the, from um, OBS, Organization of Black Students at the University of Chicago. Because they saw it in the coffee shop, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's that's the you know they took they took a poster down." <laughs> and I thought it was great. It's like, "Oh, check it. There's no more irony in the age of Obama. It's like <laughs> no more irony to being black. It's gone. Shit is serious." When <laughs> 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 my God, card. So these are just oh, something went on to autopilot. It means I'm over time. Can't hold on. Stop. Wow, I can't stop it. It's just doing this. Okay, let's, let's go back. Let's take a do this. All right. So these are installation views. Wow. Let's see if I can take it off of this timer. Sorry. Details of the individual artists. So it goes on to autopilot. Yeah. Just kicked into. Yeah. All right. So this is several silences. Um, which is the final show of these three. Um, probably uh, still important to me, um, kind of magical. Uh, in the four, all these glass, these crystal spheres, Orion Gander, a hundred of them, and they were scattered around the floor. Um, but yeah, I don't know where my head was um, at that time and moment, um, and probably couldn't recreate the headspace. Um, that I had going into the show after Black Is. Um, but was still, there was something that I was after, uh, formally. Um, and it was along the, you know, <laughs> uh, James Brown would find his musicians if they missed the beat, you know, as, as legend would have it. And it was that kind of like, a certain kind of like tightness, like, how, whereas like organizing shows, you know, you can have a really poetic title or it can be an issue oriented show, but it would still be a relatively loose affair. I mean, there's the orchestration of artwork in space, spatio temporal experience. Um, but for several silences, I did want to see how tight I could be. Like, could you drop it like James Brown tight? like on a dime, you know, like live Apollo theater, right? Where you're just like, whoa, is that medley live or is that edited? And it's like, no, they're actually turning these tunes over, you know? And so to see, it's like, how tight could you make a show in, in some sense, like really like, as far as the coordination of the pieces, but still have it be incredibly loose at the same time. So, um, yeah. So symmetry was really the space, the symmetrical, the gallery itself. So I took my cues largely from that. Um, there were two turntables, two records in the show. And um, I think if you can get things down to the point where it's like, no, 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 I actually have a show where I want to include a vinyl LP, like those kinds of things, I love, you know, artist books. So if you can really get the show and slow it down to include that kind of cultural production stuff that's out there, where it's really granular, I'm really kind of into that. Um, and feeling, like textures, moods. And I'm not as interested as like, like, 
shows with themes, and sometimes I think themes can really flatten the show out in a weird way, as opposed to like, it's like, no, 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 I don't know what the theme of the show is, but it is really strong as far as like a sensibility or something. So, some of the different installations. So Ryan Gander did the crystal spheres that were scattered around the gallery. This is Harold Mendez. These were two empty bulletin boards that he found uh, on the campus of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, he didn't do anything to them. They're just, you know, he found them, he saw them, and they'd been stripped of all of their messages. So it's a detail, just the staples with the little bits of colored paper left. Grand Fury, generationally very telling. I, I, students came and saw the show, and they actually, you know, getting old. <laughs> you know, they're 18, 19 year old students who didn't know what this meant. It never, you know, and I, it took me by surprise. Like, oh my God, they don't know. They've never seen this campaigning. They, you know, Troy Brontuk. It's Harry Shearer, silent echo chamber. And these are all pundits, politicians, in the moments um, before he got access to the B-roll before the pundits are on air, right? So they're just sitting there and being silent. So I reserve the biggest monitor for Henry Kissinger. <laughs> So in this image, there's a photograph by Geisler Sahn, an artist duo based in Chicago, originally from Germany on the left. Then I'll go back to, which is talking about symmetry. In one of the corners, this is a 45 a vinyl pressing by uh, Carl Michael von Hauswolf. And it's, um, I don't know if you can see the grooves or make up the grooves. He willfully misread John Cage's four hash or whatever the little mark is, 433. So instead of being four minutes and four minutes 33 seconds, he read it as four feet 33 inches. <laughs> and so he had a 45 press, so the actual groove that runs through it is four feet. 33 inches. <laughs> yes, there's another video. So that's, there's a Louis Baltz photograph on the right, and then on the other side, as I showed the Geisler Sahn photograph. So again, just this idea of how symmetry was really important when I was you know, thinking about being really, that's, a, that's the Baltz photograph. And that's an anechoic chamber. This is cl clinically the most silent you know, these anechoic chambers that are used by the telecommunications companies are technically, you know, supposedly the, the, the most silent spaces on the planet used to calibrate uh, instru uh, you know, electronic instruments. So that was on one side, again, here's an image. And this Geisler Sahn photograph was on the other side. And this is a space, the basement of a structure built by the military in Germany, the US military, built a training camp in Germany to train soldiers before they were shipped out to the Middle East. Um, but it's to train them in close quarters combat and how to uh, reduce the amount of trauma they experience um, in close quarters combat in terms of killing people. Um, and to run through simulations um, in closed quarters. So this is the basement of um, um, like a community center, essentially. This is a photograph. They got access for just a couple hours to photograph these spaces. So you know, this would be, as far as like symmetry and thinking about like a James Brown, like, you know, like tightness, like, okay, you know, on the dime. So yeah, so those were the, the, the trilogy of shows that came after I had gone through 
and been humbled by this the books, you know, surveying um, the catalogs of group exhibitions. And these are a couple of recent shows. This one actually just was on the road for a year and just closed down in Santa Barbara. It's called Teen Paranormal Romance. Um, and a 12 year old daughter, and she's really into uh, the whole young adult fiction uh, thing. So we read The Hunger Games together. And basically, it gave me an excuse to indulge what, you know. I probably would have done it anyway. <laughs> I watched, you know, Twilight. And yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. But um, had a lot of fun as far as culturally slumming it. <laughs> but with the with the real finds being um, Friday Night Lights. Um, it's great. Uh, um, yeah, but it was just a. Uh, she asked me to buy her. When the, 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 I think the first, the second insurgent, divergent book came out, and she, she wanted to buy it, and I thought they would have it at Powell's, which is more of you. They said, no, 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 you gotta go to a new bookstore. And I was like, hey, oh my God, this thing's gonna cost $40. It just hit the stands. It's like, God damn, like, your book bill is insane. It's like, it's worse than my book budget. <laughs> not a good thing to, like, you know, say to your daughter, like, you know, I'm not buying you any more books. Cut back on the reading. Literacy is overreading. America. Uh, minimalism is about, god damn it. Um, the killed metaphor. So we went to the, the Barnes and Noble to go get this book, and they had a section called Teen Paranormal Romance. So that's where the title of the show came from. And she just served it up to me on a platter. And by that time, after doing those three shows, I was pretty much at a point where I just thought, like, okay, um, uh, again, to return to like an excuse, what's the excuse just to get art together? What's the organizing principle? Um, uh, to make it fun for myself. Um, and, you know, here's a piece of ready made poetry in a way. Um, but I was also thinking of, um, and Paul will know this reference as well, of, like, of Jimmy Lyons, you know, so to just get to that point, or kind of like Ornette Coleman's Harmelotics, where it's just, you know, um, uh, uh, what's the, the double quartet record, you know, where it's just sort of this kind of. There's a header on the tune, but then they pretty much all just then dissolve, you know, down into like, you know, one song is interchangeable with another song. And then the next song is, you know, the opening melody is like, and the next song is, and I just wanted the show to kind of just be that. Like, it's like one show on to another show again, like, you know, but to be more fluid. And so just to, um, you know, after war and race and silence and distilling it down to one thing, to see if I could just, you know, indulge or, you know, if I'd been granted the freedom now working there for so many years to then just like do that kind of show. So um, Teen Paranormal came out of that, you know, and I did do all the research. <laughs> The, the young adult fiction being the driving force behind the publishing industry, right? And, and by default, then you know it's trans, you know those books then being translated into blockbuster movies, and you gotta have three of them. So you know it's kind of one of the economic engines of the culture industry and that kind of thing. There's lots to be said. Twilight, not Twilight, uh, True Blood. Um, that was a crazy guilty pleasure up until season four, which just kind of died. <laughs> Disappointing show. And yeah, so much promise. This is Catherine Andrews and Jack Lavender. This piece by Jack Lavender called Fantasy Line. Guyton Walker. These mattresses. Anna K. E. That's a detail. View. 
like her mattresses. That's the back of the Anakehi piece, where she just hung these different young, young women's uh, outfits and clothing, and these coat hooks, these pegs on the back of it. In the back is a piece by Roe Etheridge. <clears throat> Chris Bradley, these pieces are called Grease Faces, and they're actually, um, these are completely simulated, so they're, they're not, they look like you know, empty pizza boxes, but well, they're actually made of metal. Um, and then oil painting, even the push pins that are in them are made out of bronze. So it's completely faked. But I, it was very funny. It was really nice people when they came into the show because it was, you know, the two pizza boxes were up when you came through. And they were just like, God damn, man. This is sweet, man. It's come to this. Like, you can actually hang empty pizza boxes. And I was like, uh, yes, I would. <laughs> like, you know, the artist leads and I follow. Uh, but in fact, they're quite artful, you know, and I didn't realize that people would just actually just, you know, that they actually didn't, nobody reads the goddamn materials list. You know, what am I thinking? Um, as, as much as people just like read it as like, just like a really bleak, you know, um, assessment. So this last show, this is Suicide Narcissus. Um, and, and I worked on this one for a couple of years, and it was before, before prior to the, to the term Anthropocene coming to being, and I wanted to do a show, and all those ecology shows that are just so bad. Um, um, and again, it, it's like I'd never do an ecology show. It's like a global warming show. Um, uh, so I ended up doing my take on it, which was more about extinction. Uh, so this is what you saw when you first came into the gallery. This is Katie Patterson, All the Dead Stars. It only had, this, the show only had six pieces. Um, but on the right, if you look on the right, there's a slot. And if you looked through that slot, this is what you saw. So inside of this, a big chunk of the show is this piece by Lucy Scare called Leviathan. And this is, um, it's a, a, a baby humpback whale. Uh, her name is Piccolina. Uh, Lucy Scare had done this piece the first iteration was in Basel. Uh, the second was in London at, at the Tate. And, and I said, oh my god, I'd love to do the piece. And she could do the piece. She said, yeah, 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 I'd love to be in the show. You can do the piece. It's like, great. So, like, shipping, like, how do you deal with the skeleton thing? She's like, oh, no, no, no. You have to find a whale skeleton. Like, oh, <laughs> that's on me. <laughs> You know, I'll call you back. <laughs> and uh, found a whale skeleton. That was really quite easy, too. I can't, I can't. That's what the fucking internets are about, man. So, Piccolina is a baby humpback, about 34 feet long. Um, the head is where all the weight is. So the head weighs like, you know, you know four or 500 pounds. Um, as far as the ballast, you know, kind of thing with, with the whale. But if you looked again through that crack, you could you could see. You know, you'd have to go up, and then you could see all the whale. But it would only be in this perspective, and there was only there were only two other slots where you could peer through and just see it. So just the idea of having this very large dead thing like behind this wall that you really couldn't see just present in the gallery was kind of a I guess that Benjaminian aura. <laughs> So this is Katie Patterson. Most people just missed that slot when you came in. They just went straight back to this piece, which is laser etched aluminum. It's called All the Dead Stars. I don't know if you can see, this is a detail of it. Uh, it's all the dead stars that we know of, um, that we can see with the, from the vantage point of the Earth. This is Daniel Gustav Kramer and Harris of um, Infinite Library. A beautiful series of artist books. Yeah, so this is the, the other slot. This is how much of the whale that you saw, which is just its eye. 
you know, and you could go up and you could, it's four inches wide, so you could go up and you could peer and the edges were beveled back. So you could look and see different sections of it, but there was only one place from which you could see the whole thing. And then, and even then, when you saw it, you couldn't see the whole thing because it was, you were looking at it pretty much frontally, so you never got a sense of the thing, you know, the breadth of the whale, and you, you couldn't see it. So this is Nicole, on the left is a film by Nicole Petrish, uh, Nicole Six and Paul, Paul Petrish. Yeah. And on the right is a piece by Tomas Bauman. Yeah. And the piece, these two pieces revolved around reflection, and this is where the, the show got its, you know, where it got its title from. Um, this, that the motor loop of rope that just moves very slowly in a kind of anthropomorphic fashion. And it moves at the, on the floor below it is a strip of mirror. And, it, and, it, and it's quite uncanny in terms of its movement. It looks as though it's kind of animated, al alive. Um, and again, it was a play off of this film, this video made by Nicole and Paul, um, in which a man just walks out on a frozen um, lake. You can't see the horizon and then proceeds to take a pickaxe and make a circle around himself until eventually he goes in. Um, piece is about 28 minutes long. Except the catch being at the very last second, you know, you watch this guy, yeah, it, this is how long it takes him to do this. It's all straight up real time. At the very last second, the film goes black and you only hear him in Buster Keaton fashion fall in. So you never see it happen. Which I just thought was a beautiful allegory for you know, where we're headed. It's too late, you won't see your death. It's not gonna be like an action movie. So, I'll end there, and we can go to q &A, but thank you. post-nasal drip. I don't think I've ever used those words before. I used to think it was just an advertising fabrication, but it's true. the Atlantic. Um, they used to have a whale museum. It's a now defunct whale museum. Um, and the guy, Dan Dendanto, is his name. He now runs a company called Whales and Nails. Um, and he is responsible for uh, installing like any major whale installation. Like, Anywhere in North America, he's done it. So he has all the rigging, the transport, but he also does the, I guess, flensing is what it would be. Um, you know, uh, if, if, you know, uh, along the, he lives in Maine, um, he used to work for the museum, uh, which closed its doors, but still has all the stuff. So when I called, he's like, oh, what do you want? 64 feet, 30 feet, 18 feet, what do you want? I was like, I was like this is incredible. I'm like, I'll take, I'll take the 34 footer. He's like, great. It's like, that's a good choice because she's even got a crate. And it's like, this is better and better. And so, um, he, yeah, yeah, just his tales of when he saw the truss work in the gallery, he's like, oh my God, this is made for this. You know, so, and he was just a, a delight to, to, to work with it. But if, if he, he, one of his, jobs, jobs, part of his business is uh, whales that, that die and end up beached, you can call and they will dispose of the whale, meaning um, they actually keep the, the skeletons, the specimens for teaching, give them to schools and stuff. But um, 
to flense it, to get rid of the flesh. They basically bury it for you know more than a year and then bleach the bones in the sun. But it takes a long time for all the oil to come out. So, but I learned all this stuff about whales. It's kind of <laughs> but, but I had to sign a contract. Um, because you can't, because of the Endangered Species Act, you, you, you can't own, you can only display, you can't traffic in them. So that's basically the, you know, it's its own non-economy, I guess. But when, yeah, when he was like, oh no, you have to sign this, and that gives you the right to display it, saying that you, you know, you don't own it. Lease it, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard for me to see. I think you said something at the beginning about how the US society does not own material things, or if there was some relationship to the US that yeah. I know. Can you feel that a little bit? Yeah, it's its own, it's a separate, it's a separate, um, first not collecting. would, what do you do with your money? Where do you put your resources, right? So we're, you know, with respect to contemporary work, living artists able to do commissions, publications, basically, as opposed to acquisition, you know, and conservation, right, you know, species. So there's that at a technical level. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's a whole discussion about what does it mean to be a museum of contemporary art, like what, in, without a collection, what would, what allows us to lay claim to being a museum? I mean, to try to contextualize work, like socially and art historically, without a collection. You know, that was kind of the challenge. I mean, that's one thing about. But with respect to the university, um, no um, uh, autonomy. It it. The society, the University of Chicago was going to found a museum in 1929, right? You're a bad year to found anything. <laughs> um, so it wasn't until 1974. So the Renaissance Society kind of functioned in the, in the absence of there being an official University of Chicago museum. There's the Oriental Institute, which is its own thing. That's one of the major holdings of ancient Near East artifacts in the country. But it wasn't until 1974 that they founded the Star Museum. It, that's, at that time, it's like, well, what are we going to do with the Renaissance Society? Do we don't need it anymore, basically. You know, it's just a shell. So that's when, you know, my former boss, Suzanne, pretty much said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take it over. And there was no, but, and it was nice because it was technically, just wasn't, it was an affiliate organization. So she was basically wholly free to do whatever it is that she, she wanted to do, right? There was no, there were no, um, uh, it being set up to not own anything, not have anything. It was just a shell, just a space. That's it, right? So programmatically, you know, it, it uh, just straight up autonomy, you know, essentially. This is maybe an impossible question, but obviously it's, it's very important for you to think a lot about like the exhibition as a format. So, for for you, like within that format, like what what are the possibilities of the exhibition, and maybe sort of what are its limits? They're only, they're whatever they are. It's set by art. Um, so there's no, there's no, uh, it's not, you know, like you said, it's an impossible question <laughs> because it's like, well, actually, it only follows. And so I was joking with Heidi the other day, she was talking to so someone to come up with a theoretical, but it's like, what about, like, it's like, do we really need to have exhibitions anymore? Like this being, you know, the heart, Silicon Valley, of course this is where this question comes up in some strange and perverse kind of way. It's like, wait, wait, wait. It's like, people still make art. <laughs> like that doesn't, you know, to be so haughty is to declare, like, I want you to put it all online. <laughs> like, or something. It's like, well, that's not, you know, there is art that can function in that way and those kinds of things. But the, the, you know, I actually like limits in a way. So space, 
3,200 square feet. This is as big as we were. This is as big as, if it doesn't fit on the elevator, we can't take it, you know? <laughs> like, those were the limits, you know, literally. Like, in the idea of being a discrete space, like a room and to have a, Behind the question about exhibitions and their limits, I actually think it's, I'm, I'm going to say this, you know, like something of a smoke screen, right? Because behind that, then it would, it would like, like, like you have to go there to see it, mm -hmm. right? To see the show, to have an experience. So this idea about like, like well, what is the arts? What is an arts experience? What is going on? Is it predicated on being there, right? In physically in space time with these, with this stuff. And I would argue, yes, it is. But the the anxiety around it is like, what distinguishes the arts experience from other kinds of experiences, which of course is bound up with the avant-garde, right? So in a way that whole art life thing, in the way art itself has kind of, you know, made it, you know, perforated itself and kind of become a membrane for, you know, comparing itself or asking, being self-reflexive only in relationship to other kinds of experiences, then invites this thing about, well, is art just, is it another kind of information? Like, what do we get out of it? What does art show you or disclose or reveal that can't be gotten at in another way, right? So I would say, oh, no, no, that, that there actually, it, art is a particular kind of experience the way, and, and form in a way in terms of what it's capable of disclosing, right? Like a joke, right? You like to say, it's like, no, 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 the way a joke technically works, you know, bump, bump, and then what it revealed is like, no, no, if you explain the joke, it's not, right? The, the only way to get there is, is through that form, right? So with art, it's like, oh, wow, shit, my mind was just blown. And it's like, it's like no, 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 it can't be blown any other way. Like, it, this, this could only happen through this particular kind of thing, right? And there's a strictness to that form. Yeah, it's still a form, right? But within it, you can say whatever, like you can tell a joke about anything. Right, exactly. Right, it's totally free in this weird way. But I would still say there's still something about it. it's like no, no, no. It's still like like no, it's still like art. Like what goes on? How how it how does it work? You know, in some sense. But it's a very it's all bound. I think, but all that stuff I think is all bound up in that question about like limits, format. You know, of the show. Like, does it need to take place in a place? You know. Like different kinds of platforms. Now, that's not to say that it's all stuff in a room. I want to say it's like, no, no, no. You can have all kinds of range of things. So. Yeah, and I, you know, limits aren't necessarily a negative thing. Like, I mean, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they per 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 perceive it as perceive it as that. But I don't think there's there's no, you know. But also, just it still follows what it depends on what the work needs. Because there's certain work where it's like. Oh no no no! You shouldn't. That can't go on with alternative spaces and stuff. There's certain work that would occur in this room. It's like it would die the second it went into a museum, right? I mean, easily. Like, and there's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. But I don't think that that's that's actually slightly different than the question of limits, you know. But they're related. I don't know if that was a satisfactory. Answer. Well, yeah, I just want to start with your thoughts, so any answer is a good answer. Oh, yeah. I'm curious what your experience is like engaging with the experience of others as they went through the trilogy. Um, perhaps there's something that stands out from each individually, but then also as a whole. Oh, nobody knows that except you guys. <laughs> yeah, that was three, and oh. me. Oh. Yeah, it wasn't broadcast that way. In my mind, it really was though. I like I was like, I yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I told I told I told my therapist that I was gonna like, <laughs> and it said I said, okay, this is how this is gonna work. I'm gonna do something very bad to myself, and I'm gonna see if I can live through it. I'm gonna try and drop as many group shows in a year as I can. 
and I wanted to see if like Zan would let me. He's like, could I? It's like I could, you know, could I do five of these? You do you have five in you? Like how many you have in you? Can you get that beat going? Like it's just like a show, the show, the show. Like, uh, and and that like after those three, I was like, no, it's like no, stop, uncle. Like it's all I got. But then it, it was funny, it's like after that, it's like, I'm like, oh, oh, this is where it starts. Yeah. Like okay. a, after that kind of setup. So I guess my question is, did you engage with other people as they experienced these services? Oh yeah, I do. Oh, so yeah. How did that then, like seeing it through their eyes, how did it push your own ideas and your own words? Understanding it through their eyes as well. Okay. Yeah, I, the, the, that's funny if I could rephrase it in terms of like audience in a weird way, like it's like, which is a funny one. I don't, I mean the Renaissance Society is a really particular space. There's a lot of freedom. It's not a, it's not a street level operation. So anybody who ever gets to the threshold is like self-selecting. So we never, and that's a really huge deal in terms of the profile of the joint and how it distinguishes itself from other places. So it's never, there's a lot of like freedom in that and it's almost like like we have our back to the audience in a weird way and it's kind of like, you know, I want to say like artist centric in a certain kind of way, but it, but what that would kind of do and it's strange because I never, like being able to, it, to share, like to feel like it's like, no, 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 I can't think about, I can't think about an audience, like who's the audience for this? Which of course is like one of the primary questions and really fundamental. As much as like, it's like, no, I can do what I know and do what I love, do what I like and try and like, you know, get close to that but the spirit would be one of them like sharing with people as opposed to trying to think like, or even, but you're saying like about their response to what's already out there, right? So people ask like, it's like, are you playing a show? With, and you have an audience in mind for something. It's like, never, right? And it's just like, I, that, I can't, it's like one of the first things like, I don't know what you like. I can tell you what turns me on though. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, and that's, a, but that's the basic ethos for me. It's like, share that. Um, as opposed to things, because then you think about things like, like an audience is a presupposed body of people that exist. You have a target audience or a target demographic, as opposed to like when you're in contemporary art, it's like, how much over? You don't know who the fuck is gonna like this shit. There's no audience for that. It's like you have to build it each and every time from scratch, and that's kind of a given. And nobody wants to talk about that, right? So it's always like check the boxes and how many and all that shit. But with respect to responses with people coming in, the issues about barrier to entry, about certain things were key in terms of like learning how people like, it's like you know, I did all the hand-in-hand -hand combat with groups, you know, young and old coming through and, and so, but s certain, um, uh, like leaving people alone, you know, if you come into the room, part of the beauty of the place was like, it's like we didn't have didactic text. Yeah, there's an essay on a poster if you wanted it. But really feeling like it's like, you're here to figure this shit out for yourself and come to your own conclusions and to really respect that. That was the main thing. And I felt like that's what I got more and more out of seeing it being like, it's like, no, 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 no. Fine, they're fine. It's like, it, 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 and more often than not, you know, it's okay to not understand things. And I feel as though there's this like anxiety about having to fill in some kind of gap around that with like a museum educational apparatus or didactic or something. And it's like, as opposed to just being like, you no, know, it's like, I don't know what the fuck is going on, but it's kind of cool. Or <laughs> like, it's like, or whatever, and like walk away. But more often than not, by the time you got to the fourth floor of Cobb Hall, you were pretty much curious and could be left to, to roam. really um, resonates beautifully with some of your musical metaphors and like the way that you think about kind of like fun structures, uh, jazz structures and experimentation. Oh, yeah. you know?
now. Oh yeah, that's. I mean, that's still key. I mean, right. for me, it's like, yeah, hanging a show and like feeling a beat for in a show. Like, you know, I mean, that's really like hanging. It's really like what a show feels like in a sense of it. It's that's. I still, you know, I live for that. That's you know, just the count. And you can it's like, oh yeah, you can hang those pictures on that wall this way or this way or this. I went to Montessori. And like, so it's like it's like it's all about like rearranging furniture and possibilities. It's like, oh, or this or this. Like it's like let's do it again, except this way this time. Yeah. So. It seemed also like um, in a way, like you mentioned James Brown, like people setting up something that it seems like chaotic and, and dissonant, but actually there's so much precision and structure that allows for that wildness to happen all at once. And then it closed out. Like yeah. You had to deal with what you just witnessed and kind of felt. And yeah. The show might have that aspect of kind of you have time to unpack it. Exactly, but that yeah, that'd be like more like messy up, right? And so in some shows it's like yeah. it's like oh, no 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 no. Yeah. This, I need this needs to be messy yeah. right here. But how are you getting? It's like is it messy within the structure? Is the structure more pronounced, or is the structure going to recede, and then the mess is just going to just like let it all kind of hang out and like you know and yeah right right and do that kind of thing. But I like those kinds of challenges, you know, and feelings about different you know, different shows and the way that they accommodate. Them. So I only saw I, I I don't know that much about you, and so what I saw tonight were the history of installations. You are the you are the sole curator of the Renaissance Society and have been. No, 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 no. Me and my former boss. She was there for forty years. I was there for twenty. Okay. Yeah. So she's she's very well known. Yeah, in terms of, you know, she was she's great. So everything you do is in the is in the confines of this large room that you're presenting. Tonight. Exactly right. Exactly right. That's why I showed the room before because it's about that room, which is forty feet by eighty feet, and that's you know. No, no commissions for the campus. Oh, we did stuff. I mean, off-site. There, there were some, like, you know, on occasion as the work warranted. But that was strictly on a case-by-case -case basis, but not in any regular activity at, at, at all. It was always up in the gallery, you know. And that's we didn't. We don't have an auditorium, so like performance and those kinds of things. So it's really kind of stripped down. We were all about the show, and we only had one room, one way in, one way out. And so it was very, it's very, the, so that's one of the things I'd say that's important about it as a place. Unlike museums, they have three different shows going on, or whatever, you go in and you never know, like left or right, do I want to see etchings today, do I want to watch this piece of video, and you get all confused, and you end up in the gift shop. <laughs> like, so, we didn't have that kind of shit at all. It's basically, like, people who came there, whatever, it's like, you just go right in, Pre, see the show, and the, the focus was just like one show at a time, and that was it. So kind of like a port, but you know, like portions and control on things. It's like no, no, no. You were never in the not in different shows, but like twenty minutes. The show is a show. It's tight. You see what you see, and then that's it. But it was a, you know, I mean, it's contemporary art, so it's a pretty particular kind of audience. But they came there for that. I don't know. And not to just like rant like in a museum where it's like. Oh, you know, we're just gonna ramble through the museum today. I don't know if through. Maybe we'll look at this, and maybe we'll look at that. We were not that. Mm. Did people get confused because you're called the Renaissance Society? Oh yeah, we get calls all the time. And yeah, and so, <laughs> so not to, not to drive this down to the audience level because you so beautifully described it. Who cares about the audience when it comes to art? But how did anybody find you? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I after a while, like it's like. How do people, on the one hand, we're in a building, heavily trafficked, you would think that the student, person, forget it, no. We're on the fourth floor, the doors are open. Students never cross the threshold. They would, but only a few, a particular kind of student, right, who was like, had 10 minutes to kill or something, and would stand at the elevator and look through the doors and go, what goes on there? And they might wander in, and then they'd be, you know. But then certain things like, it's like, you know, having, Jonathan Monk's dead man, right? It was like, that guy's been fucking lying there so, uh, while I was in class. Like, it's like, is that real? And so students would come in constantly and like, like, oh my God, I thought it was a real person. You know, so that kind of stuff was always like, you know, the hook, the bait. Other than that, you know, it was a particular audience. Over the years, word of mouth, the way it's embedded in the community, that's how people, and then, 
Now, you know, over time, publications, pictures, and naturally, so that, but as far as like, you just didn't, people just didn't find us. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, there's no general public. What's gonna, so you're gone now. What's gonna happen? No, it's it's thriving. thriving. <laughs> we're just on, because you were there. We it's thriving. It's going so who's running it now? Solve a obstacle. She's from Norway. So, Hamza, I think we could exhaust you for hours. And thank All you right. well, thank so you. much. Yeah. Yeah.